Good morning, saints of heaven, Fort Baptist Church. How are you today? Good. Great to see you all here as we celebrate 111 years. My gosh, you look so good. You don't look like zombies or anything weird or anything. So, and you're all dressed. So you look good. You smell good, right? Right. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Just checking. Uh, anyway, uh, it's a great service today. We'd like to welcome Harry uh, Gardner today. And uh, Gail, uh, his wife. I knew that name. Get rid of that. Like, yeah. Yeah, free, so I'm okay. I'm amongst friends. Anyway, so glad you're here today. Uh, uh, I've known. Harry and Gail a long, a long time, and I know some other people have as well, uh, and I appreciate you being here and sharing the word with us today. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, I asked Carol for a little help, because I, I haven't really known the full history of, of the church, but just to, to let you know, land grants were given by 1760, which you probably already knew that anyway. Uh, but uh, I just thought that was really interesting, and it was uh, quite a prosperous place. Oliver Fuller, do you remember him? <laughs> no, but I, obviously the Fuller family is related to him. I would take that. Right. So they, they were doing really well with the grist mill, the sawmill, and the carding mill. But then on top of that, as time went on, there was the, uh, uh, the bricks that were repaired. Shaw bricks, right? And, and a lot of businesses have kind of flourished here over the years, which is incredible. Uh, and uh, I thought this was pretty cool. 1829, the stagecoach ran through here, but there was that reed post that somebody tore down, which is uh, heritage property. Uh, uh, and uh, so you guys have seen a lot of the changes, but it was uh, not until 1862 that it was enough, what, silk or, 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 or from the Minas Basin that, that, that people felt that they could build a place that they could come and worship. Uh, they didn't know that. Uh, I just figured this land like this was here all the time where they either must have built somewhere else or that there had been another building somewhere else besides this property here that you know of. Hey, I thought that was, that was interesting. And then... Uh, they uh, built a they uh, built a building and I, whoa, this is pretty cool. Talking about ecumenical back then, Methodists, Free Baptist, Union, Harry, Union Baptist, and Free, were we Union Baptists? Who knows, right? Uh, uh, United Baptist, Methodist, Church, uh, the Church of Baptist Born, uh, Apparently, the two there was the uh, Anglicans met as well in the building and I thought, man, way back then everybody was kind of sharing this place. What's that? They had to walk. They had to walk? Yeah. They didn't have any horses and buggies well, out there? Horses. Yeah. Anyway, but it was not until June 11, 1910, that the majority of the people were that, that gathered here were Baptists. Obviously, the people must have been building their own churches by that time. But on June 11, 1910, a vote was made, and at, uh, it was resolved that the new United Church Church, be known as the Avonport and Lockerville United Baptist Church. Therefore, that's our beginning, June 11, 1910. That makes us 111 years old. But my understanding as well is that in 1979, am I correct? In the fall of the, uh, of the year, this building is not, this building that we worship in now is 42 years old. So happy birthday! <laughs> happy anniversary! But it uh, uh, sounds like there was a lot of people who, who really had a vision for uh, this place long ago. And uh, uh, I wonder if Henry Alain would have been around mm -hmm. traveled through there back then. Amazing. But that's, that's our story. That is what makes us who we are today. And we come to worship today in this incredible place. Uh, with all those who have gone before us and uh, you and your parents 
have had a tremendous effect on this place and why you're here today. So we come today to celebrate that and, uh, and worship together. I want to uh, just let you know that following our service, there is a, uh, a social time together, so please take the opportunity to stay and join us. Everyone is welcome. Uh, I, I do, however, mention that uh, Tony's memorial service is taking place at West Street on only 2 o'clock for any who are able to, to get there for that. So. Brian, yes. it might be best to turn that mic off. This one? Yeah, for now. There. Uh, so remembering that, also uh, just want to again bring your attention. Obviously, we uh, more things have been brought through prayer than we could imagine. So uh, a reminder on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock till 2, we have prayer time together. 2 to 3 are, is a Bible study. We're beginning the Book of Romans, an introduction. Uh, so you're certainly welcome to join us then. And uh, also Tuesdays, social time. I can't even beat Gail. <laughs> so can't even beat him. So you want them? <laughs> we were close the first game. Everything else went down. We went up to that. So uh, with Crokinole. So anyway, social time together on Tuesday. I I had a dream of winning with somebody. Uh, anyway, uh, those are just some of the things that are going on. Please read the other information that's in the bulletin there. And let's begin worship as we turn to number 667 as our call to worship this morning. One in Christ. Shall we stand as we read this again? Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace that so he has been saved, through faith, but not by works. Now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For the way himself is our peace. He who has made the two one and has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. To you who to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens. In him, you two are being built together to be a dwelling place in which God lives. Amen. So we do this first verse of Come, Thou Almighty King. Praise the O God for the Spirit. 
anniversary service and all the blessings that we have received over the years and all those who've come before us, uh, again, reminding ourselves of all the good things. We uh, bring our offering up this morning as, and we sing this song again as a response to all God's gifts. Still, still the same, still, still not same, feeling still well. Leaving. Okay. Uh, anyone else I need to be remembering? Well, shall we lay our hearts in prayer? Shall we worship God? Father, I am so grateful for the fact that you are absolutely loving our worship. That when we gather together in this place as your people and we give to you uh, our praise and our adoration, it's a privilege for me to bring your people before your throne of grace. And this morning we would like to exalt your name. For you are truly God and King. To that end we will praise your name forever and ever. For great are you, Lord, and most worthy of praise. And your greatness no one can fathom. We're reminded that one generation commends your work to another so that people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. May our mouths speak in praise of you, O Lord, forever and ever. Father God, we celebrate 111 years of ministry in this community and we thank you for the great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. We thank you for the influence they've had on our lives and for the faith that has given us our Christian heritage. We realize that you have no grandchildren and that we are only one generation from extinction. Therefore, to that end, Father, may we continue to be a church that's united, that we might walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have called us with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain that unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Fill us with your spirit of love and unity as believers today. We pray that you would be glorified in all things and that the name of Jesus Christ would be exalted today. And God, count us worthy of your calling. Fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith filled with power from your spirit so that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified. Shine your light in us through your spirit. May we make a difference in our world. 
for your glory. Father, we pray for the Spirit's power and that he would fill this place and fill us today. And that we might be strengthened with power through your Spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Fill us with joy and wisdom and reminders of your presence in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for the body of Christ that it would be faithful to show love to our hurting world. May all that we do be done in love. And Father, there's always a reminder that both in seasons of celebration and in seasons of brokenness, you are still with us. That your word says you are close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit, oh God. Our comfort abounds with Christ. We ask for great miracles for a hurting world, especially in these days. And for the comfort of your spirit to bring your grace. Father, we pray for your provision and that the church would be faithful as it gives generously to the work of ministry. Thank you. We thank you in advance for your miracles, for paving our pathways, for your provision for those who love you. And thank you for the abundance of blessings and goodness, goodness that you already have given us. We pray that the church would be faithful to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he has not only lived, died, and risen again, but our hope of his return. Help us never take that for granted. Help us to share that good news in Jesus' name. Father, I want to pray for leadership in our church. I pray that you would uh, give an anointing and a blessing. I know that we can grow weary in doing good. But I know that in due season we can wait for harvest if we do not lose heart. To that end, Father, I pray that uh, you would encourage the hearts of each one here and if not recognize their gifts and abilities that they bring. Uh, I pray that their faith in your people would be unwavering. And I pray for their families that you take care of each one and give them strength and protection and grace for the days ahead. Father, I pray that we would have a love for your word. Uh, and that uh, your word you might hide in our heart, that we might not sin against you. And I pray, O oh God, for the power of protection against the enemy, because I, I know that he goes around like a roaring lion, seeking who we may devour. Therefore, may we put on the whole armor of God. Father, we pray, too, that we would wake up and be stirred into action in these days, for this is a great time for the world church to be alive. We live in that both danger and opportunity, and I pray for every open door that you give us here at Davenport to seek into our community, into our neighborhood, and into our world. As we think about that, Father, I want to remember people like uh, David Marine and ask that you be caring for him, for Gene, uh, uh, Father, for David, uh, for Dennis as well, and for others who are in need of our prayers, in need of healing, encouragement, courage, grace. And Father, for the privilege that we have not only to gather here today in worship, but the effect that that can have on our, our world and the week ahead. Father, we give all this to you as we celebrate this 111 years with thanksgiving, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The hymn I'm going to share with you today is especially meaningful to me because I sang it just last weekend at the memorial service for a dear and close friend of mine and possibly earlier this year. So I'm happy to share with you. Yeah.
Thank you very much for the invitation. And I think, do I need to turn this on? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here with you today. Um, if we were connecting earlier with Brian and Lucille, we said that we live around the corner from one another, but we rarely see each other except if we're walking. That's often the way uh, when we live nearby folks. And as I look out to you this morning, there are a number of you that we've had long-standing friendship with, and it's just the privilege of Christian fellowship to be able to come together and to share uh, with you today. Um, I think, Ken, the last time you and I saw one another, I think you were canning as the organist there. Good to see you here this morning. And I want to thank Robin for singing this morning. Um, every once in a while, I'll take a day, and we have a little trailer uh, on the North Mountain. And on Monday, I think it was, of this past week, I went there, and it just happened that the psalm that I was focused on was Psalm 91, which is the basis of the, the piece that you sang. And so I was really tempted to do what I used to do when I was preaching in the early, or, well, the early 80s. I would just say, well, scrap the message, and I would preach on Psalm 91, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'll stick with what I have prepared, but thank you so much. And you know how the Lord sometimes does just nudge you that you're on the right track? when something like that happens. And I have found often in my Christian journey that when I hear something in one place that really he's speaking to me about, it gets underscored and then maybe the highlighter again. So that's what happened for me this morning. And I'll go out of here um, looking forward to other ways that the Spirit has spoken to me in this place, but I will not soon forget that piece because it meant so much to me earlier in the week when I focused on Psalm 91. This morning, uh, I want to share with you from the book of Acts. And uh, what I'm going to read will sound to you like the ideal church. And the title of the message is The Church at Its Best. And as I'm reading this passage, you're going to be thinking, that sounds like an ideal church. There are some things about what we're going to read about here that I want to focus on, but I want you to know that just a few chapters later in the book of Acts, this very same church that I'm about to read to you about, there were two people who lied about the gifts that they gave, so much so they were, they died. Um, they were carried out, Ananias and Sapphira. Then you have a huge feud that breaks out in this church between two ethnic groups, the Hellenistic Jews and those from uh, the Jewish people themselves. There was a feud that got solved because the Holy Spirit gave wisdom to a group of people to discern how to solve the feud. So what I'm about to read to you is going to go, you're going to go, Wow, would it ever be nice to be like that as a church? But remember, within a very short time from what I'm about to read to you at the Jerusalem church, things got rocky in the relationships. And I used to think in church or in life that Christian people, everything should always be smooth. Well, did I learn quickly that's not always the case. And I am sure in the 111 years that you've had together, and by the way, congratulations, and I pray God's richest blessing on this church for many, many more fruitful years. 
Don't be disturbed, and I guess I'd say to you, if in fact there are times of struggle. The issue will be how do we resolve and work through the struggle. So, if I just closed the Bible now and we went home, that would be enough probably to hear at one point. But I want us to hear this passage because remember, and this is the part, this is, can be our problem with Scripture, and can be our problem when we look back. We might think these were perfect people. These people had hearts that beat in their chests, they had aches and pains as they got older, they had illnesses, they were concerned about one another, they had. Young families, they were just the same as you and the same as me. Except they lived in a different time, in a different place. And what we share with the people that I'm about to read is they had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus established a new community of people who not only saw him in his death and resurrection, but he infused them with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God is here because Jesus promised that when we gather in his name, he'll be with us. So we share a lot with these people. But I want to read you some characteristics of this early church. So you have immediately preceding this that the life and the death of Jesus upon the cross when they thought it was all over. Then the marvelous resurrection and then he told them to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came and bonded these people together. And this is what it was like to be in that church. On one of our trips to Israel, Gail and I visited a Baptist church in Jerusalem. Can you believe it? I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to think it was the first Baptist church that was ever there, but of course it wasn't. Um, and I love what you read earlier about this denomination and that denomination. And at the end of time, when it's all over, when we get to heaven, it's not going to be, oh, the Baptists are there and the Anglicans there, the United Church over there, somebody else. No, it's going to be those who love Jesus. That's what it comes down to. Well, here it is. Acts chapter 2. This is what it was like in that early church in Jerusalem. You ready? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the ways that you've already been speaking to us together in this host of worship today. Thank you for this church family. We pray your blessing. Come, Holy Spirit. Awaken our faith. Cause us to see Jesus in new ways and to love one another. We pray in his name. Amen. I grew up on the south shore of Nova Scotia, not far from Liverpool, inland, in a little community called Middlefield. They called it Middlefield because it was halfway between Liverpool and Caledonia, and I'm told that when they drove the mail, someone said they walked to church earlier, well, these guys, they were on horseback, they drove the mail, but they stayed up over in Middlefield, and that's what it was called, is Middlefield. If you drive through there today, there's just a few houses, and um, so that's where I grew up. We had a little Baptist church. My mom was the church clerk. And we had an annual practice, which you probably have had in this church, too, in years past, We've gotten away from some of it, what was called the annual roll call service. Anybody here remember the annual roll call service? Sure you do. Well, it's a, ba it's a Baptist thing, and it's an Atlantic Baptist thing. I've discovered that it's not something that was done uh, beyond Atlantic Canada. The purpose of the anniversary service and the purpose of the roll call service 
My mom would stand there very staunch. I'd try to get her eyes so I could kind of get a smile over her, but she'd be very serious. And the assistant clerk would be off to the other side, and my mother would read the names of the resident members. And if somebody, they would stand and they would say, either present, or they'd share a scripture, or maybe a verse of, of uh, a passage, and they'd tell a little testimony. But if someone was a non-resident member and their name was read, sometimes it would be silence. But once in a while, the assistant clerk would say, an offering. I thought it was almost like tones, like they went to school to learn how to say that. An offering. And I figured, really, that if someone ever became the assistant clerk, they'd better learn how to say, an offering. Because that's how it would be. It was a way of people saying, because annually, the role was called of that membership of that local church. And annually, they would have an opportunity to say, I'm recommitting myself to this fellowship. And I'm recommitting myself to Christ. And at an anniversary service, it's not just an opportunity to look back at what God has done and recall the history. And we do need to do that. And we do need to share how people have really through the blood, sweat, and tears, given what they've given in order for us to have what we have today in our churches. It's true. But it's really an opportunity to look forward. It's an opportunity to thank God for this fellowship of believers and to look forward. Well, as I said earlier about that Jerusalem church, and when we visited Jerusalem, Jerusalem's a thriving city. It was then and it is now. It's fraught with difficulty today. It was then and it is now. This group of people were ordinary people, except for one thing that made them extraordinary. They had encountered the Son of God. In His life, in His death, in His resurrection. And they had waited as He told them to, for the empowerment, the filling of the Spirit that was coming. And when the Spirit came upon those people, they were bonded not only to God, they were bonded to one another. In these days of COVID, there have been people who continue to be bonded to God, but they've been quite happy to be away from the fellowship of the church. Some have left the church, and they're watching online, or they're going to hear this preacher or that, that church, and others have come into the fellowship of, of the church too. But what I see in this church in Jerusalem, I'd like to offer to you this morning a few thoughts. It says they gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. They gave themselves. Now, I'm just going to say, are you ready? Some of you here this morning have hair the color of mine. All right? And what hair I have? It is. That, that's fine. I was teasing Greg earlier. He said, Greg, what happened to you? Your hair looks like mine. I haven't seen you for a while. Now, what can happen to some of us is, we might say, well, I've been to Bible study all my life. I've, I get teaching when I come to church. Let me say to you, what I find in this church is, is they gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. They gave themselves over to be taught the Word of God. I don't care how many years you've been in a Bible study or a Sunday school class or been coming to church, you and I can forget what we've heard. And we need to be reminded of the essential truths. I'm so excited Brian's preaching through Romans. I love the series you're doing. I was looking through some of the upcoming messages that you're going to be preaching. That's good because it grounds us. We need to be taught from the Scriptures. This group of people gave themselves over to the scriptures. Some of you might say, if I said to you, you should memorize scripture, you'd say, I can't do that anymore. I used to when I was a child. Remember the sword drills we used to have in Sunday school classes and all these things? Let me just say to you, you can actually still memorize. My wife said to me, I hope she won't mind uh, me saying this. A few years ago, we, I said, let's memorize Colossians 3, 1 to 17. She said, I can't do that. I said, I think you can. I just offered to you as an example. I would say to you, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, have, have everything you'll need in addition to a few other things probably. But there's, there's a lot in Colossians 3, 1 to 17. Memorize scripture. The Bible says, 
Thy word have I hidden where? In my heart, that I might not sin against you. What would happen to you if you were in a situation where you cannot pick up your Bible, your eyesight may have failed you, you may be kind of in a hospital bed and you're just laying there and you're kind of in and out of it. You want to be able to have memorized scripture that will you're able to wash over you during those times, to bring these things back. Memorize scripture. Give yourselves over to be taught. Sit under the word of God. There's a reason why in our Baptist churches, the pulpit is in the middle. There's a reason why it's central. Now, it doesn't mean in other churches it's not central. But it was so... And at an anniversary service, it's not just an opportunity to look back at what God has done and recall the history. And we do need to do that. And we do need to share how people have really, through the blood, sweat, and tears, given what they've given in order for us to have what we have today in our churches. It's true. But it's really an opportunity to look forward. It's an opportunity to thank God for this fellowship of believers and to look forward. Well, as I said earlier about that Jerusalem church, and when we visited Jerusalem, Jerusalem's a thriving city. It was then and it is now. It's fraught with difficulty today. It was then and it is now. This group of people were ordinary people, except for one thing that made them extraordinary. They had encountered the Son of God in his life, in his death, in his resurrection. And they had waited as he told them to for the empowerment, the filling of the Spirit that was coming. And when the Spirit came upon those people, they were bonded not only to God, they were bonded to one another. In these days of COVID, there have been people who continue to be bonded to God, but they've been quite happy to be away from the fellowship of the church. Some have left the church, and they're watching online, or they're going to hear this preacher or that, that church, and others have come into the fellowship of, of the church, too. But what I see in this church in Jerusalem I'd like to offer to you this morning a few thoughts. It says they gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. They gave themselves. Now, I'm just going to say it. Are you ready? Some of you here this morning have hair the color of mine. <laughs> All right? And what hair I have, it is. That, that's fine. I was teasing Greg earlier. I said, Greg, what happened to you? Your hair looks like mine. <laughs> I haven't seen you for a while. Now, what can happen to some of us is, we might say, well, I've been to Bible study all my life. I've, I get teaching when I come to church. Let me say to you, what I find in this church is, is they gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. They gave themselves over to be taught the Word of God. I don't care how many years you've been in a Bible study or a Sunday school class or been coming to church. You and I can forget what we've heard, and we need to be reminded of the essential truths. I'm so excited Brian's preaching through Romans. I love the series you're doing. I was looking through some of the upcoming messages that you're going to be preaching. That's good, because it grounds us. We need to be taught from the scriptures. This group of people gave themselves over to the scriptures. Some of you might say, if I said to you, you should memorize scripture, you'd say, I can't do that anymore. I used to when I was a child. Remember the sword drills we used to have in Sunday school classes and all these things? Let me just say to you, you can actually still memorize. My wife said to me, I hope she won't mind uh, <laughs> saying this, a few years ago, we, I said, let's memorize Colossians 3, 1 to 17. She said, I can't do that. I said, I think we can. I just offered to you as an example. I would say to you, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17 have, have everything you'll need in addition to other things probably, but there's, there's a lot in Colossians 3, 1 to 17. Memorize scripture. The Bible says, thy word have I hidden where? In my heart, that I might not sin against you. What would happen to you if you were in a situation where you cannot pick up your Bible, your eyesight may have failed you, 
you may be kind of in a hospital bed and you're just laying there and you're kind of in and out of it. You want to be able to have memorized scripture that will you're able to wash over you during those times to bring these things back. Memorize scripture. Give yourselves over to be taught. Sit under the word of God. There's a reason why in our Baptist churches the pulpit is in the middle. There's a reason why it's central. Now, it doesn't mean in other churches it's not central. But it was so key to our Baptist people, they said, we want it to be central. There's a reason why it's here. There's a reason why there's a pulpit. It's central. It's a reason why the pews are where they are. We sit under the teaching of the Word. We sit under the teaching. Are you giving yourselves over to be taught? It takes discipline. We had to get up this morning. We had to be intentional about coming to church. If you're going to a Bible study, you have to make room in your schedules for it, and you have to have a receptive heart. It says also here that they continue to meet together in the temple courts. Now, it may surprise you to realize the first Christian people Jewish people came to know Jesus. They kept up their Jewish traditions, which were to go to the temple courts for worship. And they did this regularly for a period of time. Worship is at the heart of who we are. We worship God, the Almighty. We come together with others and we worship Him. And in the final book of the Bible, Revelation 4, it says, You are worthy, O Lord our God to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and had their being. My dad was 82 before he became a Christian. He knew God. He knew God. But he was 82 before he actually surrendered his life to Jesus. But he used to say to me, all people have to do is look around. Look at the beauty of this earth. Look at the stars. They'll know there's a God. But my dad had a problem. And the problem he had was with human suffering. He couldn't imagine how, if there was a loving God, that people would have to suffer the way they did. And he lived through the war. He was actually someone who was part of taking ammunition to the front lines and bringing the wounded, many of whom died on route back, away from the front lines, in the moonlight nights, he said, I cursed God. And through his life, it wasn't that he didn't believe there was a God. He believed there was a God, but he didn't like him. It was later in his life when he came to realize the loving God. And one night, in the middle of the night, he sat up in his bed and he said out loud to my mother, who I'm sure woke up with a loud <laughs> voice, he said, God did not cause the war, people did. And that was the turning point for him becoming a follower of Jesus. The heavens declare the glory of God. And this wonderful God has sent his son that we might know him, the image of the invisible God. The Old Testament book of Isaiah, written 700 years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah went into the temple to worship, and it was there that he had the divine encounter, and he calls out, as he sees the seraphim and the glorious image of the Almighty, he says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, heaven and earth, full of your glory. Scripture says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. When I took my opportunity this past week to go to our little trailer and sit there with Psalm 91, it was my attempt to draw near to God. Make space for God. Be intentional. Get alone. Be quiet. Sometimes we come together with others. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. In our worship, we come together, we confess our sin, we place ourselves before God, we open ourselves to His Spirit. 
Worship involves our whole being. Now, I'm a Baptist, but I have to say that I've learned through the years that my whole being can actually worship God. It's perfectly fine to raise my hand in worship. Some of you go, no, it's not. Well, it is. The scripture says, lift up holy hands to the Lord. We leave that to other groups. We won't name them. <laughs> and I know one group would say, you can put one hand up, but if you ever put up two, you are in serious trouble. <laughs> well, we get hung up with some of this. We don't kneel as Baptists in our churches. Some groups have a kneeling bench where they're able to, to kneel. We pass the communion. Some come forward. We use our bodies as an opportunity to kneel before the Lord at times, to call out to Him. We use our whole body. I find when I, when I pray, I like to pray at a table, but I've learned to pray walking. I like to put my palms down on the table and give over to the Lord the things that are bothering me. And after about three or four minutes, I put my palms in this direction, and I say, come, Spirit, and teach me. Palms down, you give over to the Lord. Palms up. Use your body. Don't be afraid to kneel. Don't be afraid to bow your head. A good friend of mine in the Philippines said, you Canadians are strange people. I said, I know. What, is, what part of us is strange? He said, well, when you pray, you bow your head. God is here. And in their culture, they go like, they lift up their heads and they look up. They, call, they crawl up high mountains because they realize in Scripture, mountains have been a very holy place. Involve our whole body, but come together and worship. They came expectantly. Now, when you came here this morning, did you expect to meet God or just your friend? What happened in our hearts when we lost our expectation of actually meeting God? Do we really think anything extraordinary would happen this morning? Or did we have everything so clearly planned out that we just thought it would be as it would be? And even in our planning, did we think God would actually intervene? I'm just asking, I don't know. I know for myself, sometimes I've lost my sense of expectancy that the Holy Spirit will actually be in my heart and in my mind and in our midst together. I was ordained in Wilmot, just outside Middleton. Those were wonderful years for us. I remember one evening... We, those were the days we had evening services. And Ken will appreciate this. We did, had a lot of music, Ken. Mm -hmm. A lot of singing and a lot of praise and just wonderful times together. But I remember after that evening, something was happening. I could sense it. I could sense the Lord was doing something in our midst. And I remember that night, and Gail will remember too. I gave the benediction and nobody moved. I thought, okay, I'm at the back of the church. I look in, nobody's moved. Okay, now what do I do? I came back, and I stood in front of the people, and I said, it's quiet. Let's just wait. We became Quakers at that point. If you know the tradition of Quakers, we just waited. It seemed good for us to sing a little bit more, so I said, if someone has a verse of scripture they want to share, we stayed there for an hour. And it was a lot of quiet, but there was some sharing. But there was just this amazing sense of being in the covering of the Spirit. So much so, I said, well, group, some of you need to get along, and across the road from that church is the, cent the Christian Center of Education. I said, we'll go over there. Before we knew it, there was a cup of tea made. We shared around in fellowship with one another. And I shared that. It sends it kind of a shiver over me to remember it, because we expected God to show up. We expected people sitting under the preaching of the word to be converted. We expected people to know the impact of what it would mean to be convicted of sin. We expected the Holy Spirit to point to Jesus and in humility we bow. Worship does that. This group of people in Jerusalem devoted themselves to one another. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. And you know what that's like. 
when we care and we devote ourselves to one another. It says there was no need among them. Well, I say something hard to you this morning. How in the world would we ever know if there was any need among any of us when we're all such private people? How would we ever know? Charlie Taylor's pictures on the ADF or the Blue Bulletin out there, Charlie taught us, he said to us at Acadia, and this is the problem in churches, so here it is. <laughs> Charlie said, you choose your confessor as one in 10,000. So in other words, you don't tell everybody everything. I get that. Sometimes you choose the one out of 10,000 people to tell. You're with me? You understand what I'm saying? Charlie said, you choose your confessor. In other words, what's really in your heart, there's some things only God knows, and that's good. Some things maybe only your spouse knows, that's good. Some things there's a very tiny little group of people that know, that's good. But for the most part, we live our lives without really letting people in until something happens and we need to let people in. This group of people let people in and says they, there was no need among them. They broke bread in their homes with glad and sincere hearts. They had everything in common. And you remember when I started this morning, I said it wasn't very long before these verses and there's two people who were married to each other. They stole property and they said, we're going to sell this property, we're going to get everything we earn from that property to the church. God doesn't care if they would have given a dime. But they lied. They lied. And they brought a portion of what they earned. And it's Peter who said, you're lying to the Holy Spirit. We're not going to have that here. In fact, you're going to die because you've lied. And he did. His wife comes in and same thing. She's lying. Now, I don't know what that does to you when you're thinking. That kind of scares me a little bit about what I say to the church with respect to how I handle my giving. God does not care if you give a dime or if you give everything you have as long as you give it with what? A cheerful heart. Because the word says God loves, what kind of a giver? A cheerful giver. I've met begrudgingly givers. Oh, give, give, give that. God loves a cheerful giver. Give whatever you've intended in your heart to give. You say, well, here it is. God expects tithing. That's another day's discussion. We leave that with the pastor. <laughs> We've practiced tithing in our lives for a very long time. And we give beyond that. But I want to tell you this. God loves a cheerful giver. Whatever you decide to give. The discipline of fellowship is hard. Because it's, we called upon to forgive one another. And with this I'll close. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Do you remember the passage in John 13? And he says, after he washed their feet, he said, now, since I have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. What he's really talking about there is serving one another, caring for one another, loving one another. And one of the best ways you and I can love one another is to learn how to practice the discipline of forgiving somebody else. The scripture says, if you come to the altar and you remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift, go reconciled, and then come back and offer your gift. So if something's wrong between you and a believer, stop, go and seek reconciliation, and then come back. Luke 17, 3 says, if your brother or sister sins against you, confront them, and if they repent, forgive them. Interestingly, Jesus said, the rabbi said that the going rate for forgiveness was three times. Jesus said it's 70 times seven. In other words, infinite. Now, as I close this morning, I want to say something to you. I don't have the strength to do any of this. I don't. Except for who? The Holy Spirit. He will enable me to love others. Love at
at this point is serving regardless of the response <laughs> of the other person. Catch that? <laughs> serving regardless of the response. It's really nice when someone says, well, thank you, Harry. I really appreciate that. What happens when you serve and there's no response? Well, we serve, we love. With forgiveness, I've learned it is not an emotion, it's a choice. I choose to forgive, I practice forgiving. I choose to do that because I'm told that God in Christ has forgiven me and I'm to forgive others. Can't do anything except for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. This fellowship, you're here. You're committed to worship. You're committed to one another. You pray for one another. You care for one another. I pray God's blessing on you. And my prayer for you is that you will increase, you'll turn the dial up on your expectancy of how God is going to work in your midst. And you won't just look back and think, oh, those were really good days way back there. You'll look ahead with expectancy for how God is going to work. When is the church at its best? When it realizes, without Him, we can do nothing. But with Him, all things are possible. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this fellowship of believers. I thank you for their history and for their current experience. I pray that you would use them to impact this community and all the family relationships that they have with one another and the friendships. May this group of people be those that you would so fill with your spirit that they would be loving one another and they, their impact would be great in the community. But beyond all that, please, Holy Spirit, do your work. Lift up Jesus and may men and women and young people and children be drawn to him. In his name we pray. Amen. One of the things I asked you last week to go as you go home and pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily. I've done that all this week because I definitely needed it. And so just continue to pray for the Holy Spirit's power. As we close this service today, uh, let's turn to 720, God of grace and God of glory.
it be? And the incredible thing about that is that all that has gone before has made us ready for not only the present, but what is ahead for the future. The world needs the church so much today. And so as we go from this place, this is what I want to leave you with. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power to, uh, that is at work within us. To him, get this, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. Jesus, take care.